thank all of you for joining us after the great lunch presentation. Um, before we get started, I uh, briefly want to get through a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, we want to thank the Mexican Foreign Council, Comexi, for co-hosting this session and uh, give a special greeting to all of those who are watching in Mexico City on our Facebook Live. Conversations like this play an important role in the Pacific Council's ongoing Mexico initiative, and it's great to be here today joining that conversation. And also before we get started, I want to give a warm welcome to Embajador Carlos uh, Garcia de Alba, Consul General de, de México aquí en Los Angeles. Consul, gracias. muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos. My name is Andy Carey. I am the Executive Director of the U.S.-Mexico Border Philanthropy Partnership. We are a nonprofit organization that is binationally incorporated to promote charitable giving between the United States and Mexico. We were started 10 years ago and we have a member network of 300 organizations from academia, business and corporate partners, government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and philanthropy that expands the 10 border state uh, region between the United States and Mexico. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, be the moderator today, and we have a very dynamic panel. I'm gonna give a brief uh, introduction of each of the uh, panelists, and then I'm gonna invite each of them to give some opening remarks. But before we do that, I want to share just some, to set the stage about the U.S.-Mexico relationship. Uh, the U.S.-Mexico relationship is, in a political conversation is more challenged today than it ever has been. But unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorance uh, across the board because people don't understand how closely connected our two countries actually are. Recent studies have shown that over 5 million U.S. jobs depend on trade with Mexico. Over 5 million jobs. 22 of the 50 American states have Mexico as their number one trade partner. Over 22 states. We are all here today in the state of California. So just to give a little history about how California is impacted by trade relations with Mexico. The total trade relationship between Mexico and the state of California represents $71.9 billion annually. $71.9 billion. $26.8 billion of that is exports directly to Mexico. Computers and electronics represent $6.7 billion from California into Mexico, just in computer and electronics. Transportation equipment represents $2.9 billion, and that makes Mexico the largest export market for our transportation equipment from the state of California. 79% of all soups and 65% of all grapes that are exported to Mexico are grown in the state of California. 34% of all video game consoles that are exported from California go directly to Mexico in over 565,000 jobs in California depend upon trade with Mexico. And most importantly for all of us in this great state of tourism, of 17 million visitors that visit California, nearly half are from Mexico and over half a million, 540,000 actually, arrive by air. So that means half of the people that are coming to our restaurants, visiting our amusement parks, our museums, coming to our shopping malls are coming here from Mexico. So we are absolutely tied, um, inextricably linked to Mexico. And through stronger ties uh, with people and commerce and tourism and culture um, across the country, you can see even recently during the Fiestas Patrias, you can just see the enthusiasm for people in our local communities for the close ties with Mexico. So uh, I think we're gonna have a very dynamic discussion and I'm very pleased to introduce my new friends and colleagues. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Luis Madrazo, who was the senior economic advisor and spokesman to Jose Antonio Meade's campaign for president of Mexico during the 2018 campaign. Prior to this, he served as chief economist at Mexico's Ministry of Finance, overseeing the successful fiscal consolidation process of 2015 to 2018. On his left is uh, Antonio Ortiz Meña, who is the Senior Vice President at ASG, where he provides strategic counsel and assistance to clients across Latin America. Prior to joining ASG, Dr. Ortiz Meña served for over eight years as the Head of Economic Affairs at the Embassy of Mexico in the United States. 
And to his left is our dear friend, Jennifer Piscopo, who is assistant professor of politics at Occidental College. Her research on elections, political representation, and gender equality in Latin America has appeared in leading academic journals in multiple edited volumes. So I want to thank the three of you for joining us. And to get started, Luis, why don't you give your brief opening remarks? Well, thank you very much, Andy and uh, uh, panelists. And a little housekeeping is in order. Uh, I, I saw in some of the briefings that stated that I was at the Ministry of Finance. I was for 15 years. I'm not anymore. I don't want to embarrass my colleagues at the Ministry of Finance with anything I say <laughs> that they may not agree with. Um, on that vein as well, uh, I feel about these issues very passionately because my wife's American, my children are binational. So these issues to me are very personal. Um, I think you did well in describe with numbers the closeness of the relationship between Mexico and the US. I would like to wrap it up by saying that it is very clear from those numbers that for both Mexico and the US, the most important strategic relationship over the next generation is with each other. Looking away from that uh, is just very hard to fathom as a premise for good policy making on either side of the border. Why is this? Is it because of NAFTA? or uh, however we're going to call it going forward, I, I, I would argue no. I, I would argue that the depth of integration between Mexico and the U.S. is due to fundamentals. And uh, being an economist, I'll, I'll just state a few of them that, that I think are, are pretty self-evident. The first is geography, a shared border. The second important one, and that's what explains what is behind the thrust of, uh, of co-investment and trade, is the complementarities in our demography. Mexico has a much younger population and a poorer population. The stock of capital and the stock of capital per capita is different across the US and Mexico. And therefore there are gains from trade that are gonna be structurally significant for at least a generation or two. This will lead in and of itself to a lot of incentives to trade and invest across the border or to transfer populations or all of the above. So is it driven by NAFTA? I would argue no. What is the role of NAFTA? NAFTA's role has been to give certainty and order to this process. Now, starting from this premise, I would argue, and, and here I'll share a little bit of my personal experience. Um, I left the ministry a few months ago to join one of the political campaigns, which uh, unfortunately did not succeed. And the reason I did that is because um, I think uh, some of the policy proposals on this side of the border, on the Trump campaign, are dangerous for the US and Mexico. I thought some of the proposals on the other side of the border, particularly with AMLO, were dangerous, but I thought the combination of those two was particularly dangerous. A populist confrontation that did not lead or that would interfere with the framework that NAFTA has given us for integration was a particularly dangerous proposition for uh, the, the, the thrust of integration between Mexico and the United States. Now, uh, I, I say this uh, just to emphasize that uh, derailing of NAFTA posed a unique danger for the relationship between Mexico and the US. And therefore, a successful renegotiation of NAFTA, and I want to define that in a, in a broad sense, is a very good piece of news for both Mexico and the US. Uh, if you look at the end result of the negotiations, I think it's a, a process that was very unorthodox on the outside, but on the inside, it was actually pretty traditional. And it is an upgrade on integrating uh, the digital component of the economy, energy and telecoms, which were not originally part of NAFTA. Uh, it does have some elements that, as somebody who believes in free trade, uh, I don't think are ideal. But I think the worst impulses that were presented as negotiation tactics or positions for NAFTA, a sunset clause, regional limitations on agricultural products, the elimination of dispute resolution uh, mechanisms, um, a regulation of currency uh, regarding currency manipulation or pretend uh, currency manipulation as an excuse for limiting trade. All these really bad policy ideas have been taken off the table. Uh, just in the end, my conclusion would be that uh, I think we're fortunate enough in this very uncertain times where there are bad policy ideas and I, I don't want to call it populism, but the discontent on both sides of the border could end up with really bad policy ideas conflicting and damaging the relationship long term. If we approve NAFTA as it was negotiated, we'll probably be taken off the front burner and put in the back burner. And that is a very good thing because it will allow 
the structural reasons why Mexico and the U.S. have integrated economically and socially to continue on that road. In that sense, I would advocate for a swift uh, confirmation of the treaty here in the United States, and I hope Mexico will do likewise. Uh, and just to point out, uh, to, to round up what, what I think are the biggest challenges going forward, I think NAFTA and the broader NAFTA was the biggest challenge. Fortunately, I think we could probably set it on course, on an institutional course. And the, the two most obvious ones have to do with drug trafficking and the rule of law in Mexico. I think as long as the United States has a prohibitionist policy regarding any very popular drugs, there will be an incentive to have Mexico as a staging ground for introducing the drugs, and that will generate an incentive to control territory, and therefore that rent-seeking effort in Mexico will take the form of violence, at least partially so. And finally, I will add one last risk that I see going forward, and this is more long-term. Um, I was happy to see Donald Trump uh, trying to make the sale for NAFTA and saying, well, we can turn the page. Uh, a lot of people ask me, do you think that's going to happen? How is, he, how is Donald Trump who said this is the worst treaty ever going to sell the treaty in the United States? So it's very easy. The old one was the worst one ever. This one is the best one ever. But, <laughs> and, and we laugh, and it's laughable. But there is a danger. I think free trade, as originally proposed to our populations in, in our democracy 25 years ago, was sold uh, somewhat disingenuously. Obviously, there are winners and losers from trade, and we needed to do something about to mitigate the cost to the losers. We probably didn't do as good an effort as we should have. I still think trade is obviously beneficial in general for both countries, uh, but it does scare me a little bit that free trade and all policies in general on both sides of the border to be sold and explained to the population starting from false premises, starting from saying this will reverse the deficit between Mexico and the U.S. That is unlikely to happen as long as the U.S. consumes a lot more than it saves. So if we already made the sale of a good thing in a disingenuous way 25 years ago, and that led to opposition building up over the past 25 years, I do think it's risky that the current treaty is being sold in an unorthodox fashion to both populations in this way. So I'll, I'll take ratification however it comes, and if Trump uses that kind of rhetoric, I'm willing to live with that, but I do like to point that out as a long-term risk. A long-term risk to the healthy, development of policy and politics in the United States, and because Mexico has such a strong and important relationship with the United States, it affects us as well, and we're not free of that uh, sin on the Mexican side of the border as well. So uh, that would be my first take on, on where we stand and what are the risks going forward for this very important relationship for both countries. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Luis. Antonio. Okay. Thank you, uh, and I want to thank Comexi, who you know, started the invitation, and then the Pacific Council, and thank the Council and Tatiana for uh, being here. And what I thought I would do is give some opening remark with my view on whatever you want to call it, the new NAFTA. Uh, there's a Twitter poll going on in Mexico, as we speak up, about the new name, and then to share my views about economic policy under Lopez Obrador, because of course this can affect bilateral relations. And given that we're in, in uh, Los Angeles, I, I was thinking, how should I sort of uh, summarize my views on the, uh, on the uh, new agreement? So I decided to focus on the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, a film by Sergio uh, Leone. So let me share what I think is the good about the new agreement. First of all, that is trilateral. I think having it as a bilateral would have been a strategic uh, mistake from both an economic and a political uh, perspective. Secondly, uh, you know, my generation, perhaps the generation of Luis, uh, was at the forefront in saying, hey, you know, the U.S. is not the enemy, stop this, you know, they took half our territory, etc. We've got to look forward, we have to have constructive relations. And the main element for that was the NAFTA. And the NAFTA was sort of the, the reset button in bilateral relations. So if the negotiation had failed, I think they would really have affected bilateral relations across the board on migration and security, not only, not, only, not only on trade. So that is very, very important. Also, that it's a uh, new and modern and very broad agreement. 
why the U.S. had to go th this route instead of the Trans-Pacific Partnership beats me, but there are a lot of elements from the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that is in this agreement, which is the best ever agreement in the world, okay? <laughs> Whatever it takes. Um, and there are no uh, uh, trade restrictions based on the trade balance, you know, reflecting this obsession with whether the U.S. has a surplus or deficit with Mexico, which is good. What do I think is uh, the bad? You know, I think we're back to more managed trade. Just like NAFTA was at the forefront when it was negotiated in the early 90s, I think this is the new type of agreement that the U.S. wants to negotiate. And it has very restrictive rules of origin on, on autos, but also on chemicals. And when I look at the logic of this, I think of import substitution industrialization. You know, you might not have tariffs, but restrictive rules of origin can be equivalent. And you know, we tried that, it worked for a while, but you cannot do this forever. So I'm concerned about inefficiencies derived from uh, restrictive rules of origin and about the U.S. possibly imposing uh, Section 232, that is to say, national security tariffs on auto trade that could really make sort of a North America fortress because a lot of companies will not comply with the new rules of origin unless the WTO option, most favored nation tariff option, is taken away. So I think that's a medium uh, uh, term risk, not even a long term risk, the US 232 tariffs on auto. So I don't like that. And I think a missed opportunity had to do with government procurement, not only to provide for greater access to each other country's market, but specifically to provide for sub-federal access. Uh, specifically, uh, the U.S. has a number of restrictions based on what we call Buy American provisions. I won't get into the details, but you know, in theory, Mexican companies have uh, great access in practice. They have some challenges. But specifically, this is a, 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 an opportunity that was lost for Mexico because as Mexicans, we complain a lot about corruption, especially at the sub-federal level. You know, some Mexican government uh, governors are in jail or they're gone, they've gone AWOL. And I think that if procurement had included procurement at the sub-federal level, that would have created greater transparency and greater accountability. So I see this as part of the fight against corruption, not only economic efficiency terms. So I think that's sort of a bad, a lost opportunity. What about the ugly? Uh, well, the first thing is that ratification is not assured. I think that Canada and Mexico will ratify the agreement. And I think that ultimately the US will ratify, but it's not guaranteed. It will be a tough fight of the uh, precedent of the NAFTA uh, ratification process is an indicator. It'll be rough and there could be side deals. I mean, it's, it's messy. So uh, I think we're, we're not there yet. You know, I remember when my kids were, you know, younger, you know, uh, we were driving somewhere and they asked, are we there yet? And they said, no, we're not there yet. So we're not there yet. And I might also say that these things are also personal for me. My wife is Chilanga, okay? Mm -hmm. But two of my three children were born in San Diego, you know, and I you know, spent many years in California. So this is not a theoretical issue. You know, this is, affects my family mm -hmm. life. Um, Another th thing that I think is ugly is if the U.S. draws the long lesson. I think the U.S. used hard arm tactics against Mexico and against Canada. It imposed Section 232 tariffs on uh, aluminum and steel. I don't think that's the way to treat neighbors. I don't think that's the way to treat allies. I don't think that's the way to treat France. And I don't think that's the way to treat China. So there is a risk that the U.S. could miscalculate and play this uh, brinksmanship with uh, China. And there could be miscalculations and the global economy could be adversely affected. And right now, uh, the WTO is in a very difficult uh, position. Its dispute settlement body is weakened. You know, we can get into the details. But I think that's a medium term risk that the U.S. takes the wrong lessons from this and say, you know, see you again. And, you know, we might have uh, some problems. Uh, I uh, finished a, a memo that we usually distribute to uh, clients, uh, but we decided to make it public uh, uh, this week, so it's available, and I'll be glad to share it to provide more more uh, details. Now, very briefly, can I have like two minutes to talk, Amlo? Yeah, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. <laughs>
The question is, who is the real, real AMLO? I have no idea, okay? Mm -hmm. I have no idea, I don't. But I do know where to look. So I would say for uh, both academics and companies looking at AMLO's likely economic policy, I would focus on the following. You know, the final, final appointments to the economic cabinet. Secondly, is he paying attention to them? You know, he might have good officials, you know, but do they have any authority or not? That's the second issue I would look at. Thirdly, how are economic decisions arrived at? I'm not so concerned about decisions per se, but how they arrive at. Are they by, you know, you know, inspiration, uh, by sham public consultations? You know, so I'm really concerned about the process rather than about the decisions per se. And finally, I am concerned about uh, checks and balances and accountability. I don't see a lot of them, maybe the markets, maybe the judicial branch, but I don't see a lot in terms of executive legislative relations or federal state relations. And if there's too much political concentration, there will be bad economic policy. I can guarantee that because we've been there, right? So I'm really concerned about that. I'll leave that in, in that optimistic note. Uh, uh, Andy and Mary, we can take, take it to Jennifer. Thank you, Antonio. Jennifer. Great, thank you so much, and thank you to my fellow panelists, and thank you for the invitation to join you today. So I'm actually going to go on a slightly different tact, uh, put on my professor hat, and I wanna offer you um, the perspective from Mexico. So what are the challenges and the policy options for Mexico? So you can think about this as your Mexican Politics 101 class in, in seven minutes. Um, so we know that Mexico um, will inaugurate officially its new, its new president, and the new Congress has already seated. So AMLO, AMLO um, his party, the Morena party, has a majority control of Congress. They control both chambers of Congress. And so for those of you that might not know, you know, I wanna stress that Mexico has a large Congress. Legislators in the same chamber are elected in different manners, meaning they have different representational mandates. So there's 500 seats in the lower chamber. Some legislators are elected in constituencies like we do in the United States, and some are elected from party lists. There's 128 seats in the Senate. This is a large Congress. There are many legislators, and often they serve different masters. So in both chambers, Morena has a handy majority. And I want to also add um, the new Congress is 50% women due to a gender parity law where all political parties must run half men and half women as their candidates. So in that sense, at least, the new Congress is more representative of the society that it serves. But in terms of the party majority, I want to point out that the recent past presidents, Enrique Peña Nieto, Felipe Calderón, Vicente Fox, did not have majorities in Congress. They had sizable pluralities. So this is a moment in recent history where finally, if you would just use that word as a non-normative sense, but just in terms of time, the Mexican president has a majority in Congress to enact the agenda. In the 2018 elections, what political scientists are looking at is the complete defeat of Mexico's traditional three parties, the PAN on the right, the PRI as a heterogeneous centrist party. Um, my colleague says, who's AMLO? I don't know. Right now, I think the question is, what does the PRI represent? We're not sure. Um, and the, the PRD on the left. The PAN and the PRI have the second largest majorities in the Congress right now, but I need to stress that is not a lot. The PAN holds 83 seats which is a small number, and the PRI holds 45 compared to the 212 it won in the last elections. This is for the lower house. So the PAN will be in the opposition, but the PRI is in disarray. And so a group within the PRI has announced its intention to split, reorganize a new party, change its names. And I think that this is a serious blow for the party that governed Mexico for 71 years from 1929 to 2000, and then returned seemingly resurgent with the election of Peña Nieto in 2012 with a near majority, a sizable plurality, and to go down to 45 seats in the Chamber of Deputies six years later is quite serious. 
So it's hard to understate um, the consequences of the fracturing of the traditional party system in Mexico. It raises questions about the future of political representation. So will parties be able to maintain their brand and their label? That matters because citizens who might be dissatisfied with Morena, and I'll come back to that in a moment, are going to need representational opportunities in other parties. But I do want to mention that the fracturing of the traditional party system in Mexico is not just a Mexican problem. It's happening throughout Latin America, and I'm happy to say more about that in the Q&A. So on this note, you know, why did AMLO win? And I think what I underscore is that AMLO won not so much because voters wanted him, but they didn't want any of the other guys. So the question about the importance of having multiple parties who can provide representational vehicles for citizens of diverse ideological views is extremely important because when those parties start to break down, there is a move to these outsider candidates. To give you some examples, um, the most respected public opinion data that we have for academic research comes out of Vanderbilt University, the Latin American Public Opinion Survey. On the 2016 to 2017 survey, Mexicans were asked on a 1.7 scale, do you trust the political parties where seven was not at all? 46% chose seven. They didn't hedge, they didn't choose six, they didn't choose five, they went with seven. So my concerns about the party system and can it adequately represent uh, Mexicans is, is real. However, on the bright side, thinking about the good, um, when folks were asked about political institutions, do you trust Congress? Do you trust the government? Then only 17, 20% respectively chose seven. So we see that people are distinguishing between the institutions and those in the institutions, which is good for long-term democratic stability. So they don't like their current options, but they trust in the institutions. And for those of you who are at the lunchtime debate, um, there was a focus on populism um, and it is true, populism is about this charismatic leader, but a key definition is when, as my colleague started to hint at, when the charismatic leader governs within the existing institutions or when those institutions are cut out, right? And the charismatic leader makes decisions on his or her own. So I do think there's a bright spot with at least the faith in the institutions, if not the current occupants of those institutions in Mexico. And I think in this sense, um, the rising tide can lift all boats if AMLO has success in policy, and I will talk in a moment about what I think some of those policy challenges are beyond the economics. Um, the rising tide could lift all boats in the sense that it could solidify or re-solidify um, the PAN and the PRI under clear programmatic goals. Midterm elections are in 20, in Mexico will be, I wrote 2018, that is wrong, they'll be in 2021. So it's a six year presidential mandate. The Congress renews halfway through, the entire Congress will renew. It's not a partial renewal, both the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. So that will be an important bellwether. AMLO has three years to try to make good on um, the wave that has elected him to office, which is saying we want something different uh, let's see what you have. So what is it that is wanted different? So part of what fueled AMLO's win, the dissatisfaction with traditional parties and leaders, dissatisfaction with violence, corruption, stalled economic growth, and especially violence. So in my last two minutes, I wanna lift up some of the policy challenges in those areas. So on that same public opinion survey, when Mexicans were asked how many politicians were corrupt, 77% chose more than half or all. Okay, so there is widespread dissatisfaction with corruption. AMLO has proposed a calling of the bureaucracy. He's proposed limiting top official salaries, which is a repeat of what he did when he was mayor of Mexico City, and a limit on public officials' perks, no travel abroad without authorization, no access to government-owned transportation, bans or strict limits on gifts, parties, and events, and incorporating public officials into the public social security scheme. So his austerity plan is very much about um, looking to address public spending through lavish benefits for public officials. And I'm kind of remaining agnostic on whether these are not good ideas or not. I just want to let you know what is on the table and what is being discussed. 
a really big challenge he's facing right now, and it, it's not small, even though it might sound like a side issue, is the construction of a brand new, very expensive, shiny airport on the outskirts of Mexico City. The costs are spiraling. Uh, there are allegations that the government attained the land through shady deals. There are protests from the indigenous groups that occupy the land, concerns about environmental impact, uh, can, and there is a argument that the current airport construction is unviable. AMLO's proposals for what to do instead are sort of not realistic. Uh, have Puebla, which is two hours away, be the overflow airport instead. Um, and 63% of Mexicans support moving forward with the new airport. But this is sort of an immediate boondoggle that he will have to confront upon taking office. And it is being discussed quite frequently, despite you're like, oh, an airport's not a big... Well, we live in Los Angeles. We know that, that the airport can be a a tough situation. Uh, violence. I think it is impossible to talk about the current political situation without talking about violence. Um, I don't bring statistics anymore because the records are continuously being broken. Um, on average, a recent stat I did pull, on average, four people killed per hour. That's countrywide. Uh, widespread impunity, five out of 100 murder cases result in conviction. Only Syria has worse figures for forced disappearances. The stats I did give you are when we have bodies, not for people that are disappeared. So only Syria has worse figures for forced disappearances and only Syria is a worse country in which to be a journalist. In the most recent elections, there were over 130 candidates or candidate staffs killed. These were mostly candidates for local offices and some of the most affected states. And so there's often this interesting disconnect where the violence is not reaching the policymakers in Mexico City, though some states do confront very high levels of violence. AMLO has proposed a sort of love and hugs and kisses approach to the violence, um, which I don't, don't want to make light of, but given the scale of the situation, it's not clear that offering amnesty is sufficient when you already don't prosecute the crimes you have. So amnesty hardly seems like a deterrent. Um, I do think it is very likely um, that the government will move to legalize marijuana. I think they will do that not as a standalone reform, but as part of a broader package to address the violence and security situation. Uh, I think it has better success if it's part of a broader package of reforms. I think it won't work as a standalone legislation. Again, I'm agnostic as to whether or not that's a good idea, but I do think we can expect to see a move in that direction. Um, and. I think beyond that, you know, there's a proposal on the table to create a new attorney general's office, also with that package of reforms. But again, the question is, what will that look like and can it actually be effective? And then on the theme of the populism, I just want to end with a note about education policy. I think you can expect to see some early moves on this. So one of uh, Peña Nieto's, the outgoing president's signature reforms was breaking the teacher union stranglehold over hiring. So in Mexico, um, many teacher positions were seen as sort of public goods that could be transferred by the teacher to another individual without any performance review or training. They were almost um, patronage jobs in some contexts. So one of the, in the educational system is, is widely recognized to be problematic on that and other aspects. So Peña Nieto, um, passed a very comprehensive, ambitious education reform that would introduce performance reviews, direct paying by the government to the teachers, therefore bypassing the unions and breaking the sort of unions control over these positions that it could distribute like pork. Um, the teachers unions supported AMLO. They were critical to his election coalition. And so perhaps one of his most populist moves so far, although I don't think he is a populist, but I think one of his more populist moves has been to announce that this education reform will be repealed. So hopefully that gives you a little sense of, in addition to NAFTA and trade, what is also on the table and some of the challenges. Thank you all. That uh, very uh, interesting and uh, provocative remarks uh, talking about the state of U.S.-Mexico relations. Thanks to each of you. Uh, what we'd like to do for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes is have a series of questions and then following those questions, we're gonna open it up to the audience uh, for your participation. Yeah, two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to attend the U.S.-Mexico Border Mayor's Summit. 
and former ambassadors Arturo Sarucan and Earl Anthony Wayne, uh, the former ambassadors from Mexico to the United States and from the United States to Mexico were both present and they had a very engaging seminar and they talked about uh, where is the center core of the U.S.-Mexico relationship? And both of them challenged the mayors from the 10 border states to actually sort of force uh, sort of a taking of the power of the decisions affecting the U.S.-Mexico relationship from Washington, D.C. and from Mexico City and putting it at the local mm. levels and getting the mayors and local politicians because that's really where the economics debate uh, happens. For the last 10 years, people have been talking about, oh, NAFTA needs to be adjusted, and some people, like our current president, said we should just throw it out, and so we've come out with this renegotiation. And I'd like to ask our, our panelists um, how the NAFTA renegotiations have, uh, since they've occupied so much public attention uh, about the U.S.-Mexico relationship, um, what do you see the most pressing items and issues are for the re bi-national relationship as it relates to the U.S.-Mexico-Canada relationship going forward. Who would like to go first? Antonio? Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, so in terms of the, the most pressing issues in the uh, bilateral relations, I would say in the immediate term, the removal of uh, Section 232 tariffs on aluminum and steel, because I don't see the political conditions for either Mexico or Canada to sign the deal. So there's a draft agreement, it has to be cleaned up. The idea is for Prime Minister Trudeau and the two presidents to sign this deal at the end of November. Now, signature does not mean ratification, it's, it's a pretty complicated process. So the agreement is signed and then Congress would have hearings. And I don't think the agreement can be signed if those tariffs are in place. So that's the immediate challenge because we need this agreement uh, ratified. Uh, going forward, I would say uh, the institutions governing the bilateral relationship. Uh, when I had the privilege of being a, a diplomat in Washington, we had something called the high level economic dialogue where you had ministries from a range of uh, disciplines in Mexico working together with their counterparts in the US to deal with tough issues, for example, uh, you know, cross-border issues. You, know, you you need the Ministry of the Economy, but you need the Finance Ministry, Communications, you need the Mexican Customs Administration, and the U.S. counterpart. So you need a multi-agency interaction. And this mechanism is no longer working, so you do a lot of sort of ad hoc uh, work, which is good in the short term, but not in the medium and long term. You know, the uh, Mexican Foreign Minister Videgaray, you know, gets together with Jared Kushner, and they've been able to work wonders. But that's a pretty sort of uh, endeavorly weak way to manage relations going forward. So I think that uh, institution building, and secondly, speaking about local issues, um, you know, supposedly in the federal uh, U.S. Congress, uh, there is a local connection. Right, and I didn't see a lot of voices willing to speak very frankly and forthrightly about the benefits for the U.S. of having a constructive political and economic relationship with the U.S. It's like you know nobody wanted to you know stick their head out because their neck could be caught, uh, and I think it's really important for local actors to be to not be afraid to speak out and to share their views about how their uh, relation with Mexico affects them. There are some tough issues, but I would say that overall, it is a positive and a necessary uh, relationship. So I, th I think that's a challenge going forward. Thank you. Um, I think it's very common, especially in an era where um, national governments are posturing in certain ways, are unwilling to come to the table, at least insofar as they'll say publicly, to see the, the bypassing of the national government and for cities to develop diplomacy with other cities, right? And so you almost now have this boomerang diplomacy, right, where the national government in one country is actually relying more on, and I'm very 
con- you know, conscious that we have a, a consul in the room, right, is relying more on its consuls in cities rather than its embassy in the other country's capital to do that important diplomatic work. And so it's unsurprising that we see that at the, at the local level. And especially as my colleague mentioned, you know, the nationalization of policy in the United States such that representatives who ostensibly come from districts within states and senators who ostensibly come from states speak more to the policy in terms of the party's overall priorities and the nation's overall priorities rather than rather than their district. So I think one of the other places that when we see this kind of boomerang diplomacy, right, where the embassy is bypassed or the national government is bypassed and the interactions happen right with the local government and right with the local mayors, um, in the case of U.S.-Mexico, I think it's really important to think about immigration the perspective of these actors on immigration because of their, to use a term that came up in lunch, their lived experience is very different, right? Is often more empathetic, is often more practical, is often more instrumental than what is being expressed at the national government. So I think in addition to trade, there is a lot of opportunity for those local actors to speak up about the realities of immigration and border crossing because they look quite different than what our national leaders want us to think they look like. Please. Thank you. Um, trying to look at the, at the issues going forward, I think we've dwelled upon that and, and, and we agree that the most relevant issue right now is ratification and 232 goes along with that. I would argue long term, and I said this in my opening remarks, it's, it's a drug trade and mm-hmm. the impact of uh, U.S. prohibition on Mexican violence, the arming and financing of violence in Mexico, it's structural. And it will take a long time to get fixed. The U.S. is not going anywhere near near fixing that problem, and it's a joint problem. Um, the the one issue I wanted to talk about in my introductory remarks, but I ran out of time, are the macro challenges for Mexico. And I mean, just we're starting a cycle of rate increases in the U.S. That usually coincides with complicated times for emerging markets, particularly Mexico. Uh, it's happening uh, at a time in which oil prices are doing okay. And uh, I think Mexico has a lot of strengths, one of them being that the level of discontent in Mexico has decreased after the election. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there are serious policy challenges and particularly macro stability will be tested. Mexico has had good policy making at the macro level for a long time. And I think arguably it was one of the things that allowed us to overcome many of the external shocks that hit us in 2014, 2016. So we're gonna see how we go forward with an unproven policy team. There hasn't been, there's been a a big rift in in policy making and we'll see if the new team, the people being appointed to at at least the Ministry of Finance seem to be uh, people who are well-intentioned, well-educated, smart, uh, but they have zero experience in the Ministry of Finance. So that's that's already a challenge. So now let me look at some of the policy issues and and, and try to bring them together with what Jennifer said. she said, and I think she described it correctly, that the premise of López Obrador's macro policy is that by reducing perks and lowering salaries, they're going to basically balance the budget and do and carry out their priorities uh, on based on, on those economies. Um, there's no way the numbers work up. And the funniest and most ironic thing about it is that it's all about blaming the bureaucrats and taking away these horrible perks they had, when actually the size of the bureaucracy in Mexico was relatively small, to almost by any metric compared with any other government, and salaries have been going down for the past 20 years. But there are some areas of government where we have had big perks, particularly education. And on education and on the power company and the energy company syndicates, his actual concrete promises are to return the mm-hmm. perks that have been taken away. So there is this big contradiction and this irony in that the whole premise of the macro policy is based on economies out of the many non-existent perks. And when the actual proposals are to reintroduce the perks where they actually did exist and uh, were pretty big. So that doesn't add up. That doesn't mean that there will be chaos. That doesn't mean they will actually go ahead and try to implement these non-workable numbers. Mm-hmm. But it is a, a, a warning a shot across the bow. I think on the airport, again, if we don't have an airport, that's really bad for Mexico, it's not the end of the world. But what we've seen over the past few months, even during the transition and only the campaign, is a decision-making process that makes no sense at all. Anybody who has looked at the issue of the airport knows 
could always do it better, but you should just finish the airport you've already spent 24 years planning and six years building. It makes no sense to stop it, and we might do it next week. You don't want to fly in the Puebla? <laughs> <laughs> and, and finally, you mentioned very optimistically that uh, they might legalize marijuana, which might be a good thing on public health grounds, on uh, philosophical grounds, if you agree with it. Um, but that would be much better if it was part of an integral proposal for reducing violence, which is nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. Because the principle, and I, going back to the, our lunch conversation, I do think there are underlying international currents that, that the wave of discontent coincides in time with the global financial crisis. So there's obviously common elements around the world. If there's a Mexico-specific element to the discontent, it probably has to do with corruption, but I would argue probably more with violence. People were really fed up with violence, and you could see it on the original polling. So the biggest element that brought about the discontent that brought us this big political wave probably has to do with violence. And we have yet to hear of, if it does exist, for a coherent policy proposal to lower violence. I think, as you said, it would be very nice if it came about. But we have seen no sign of it. And usually in campaigns, if you've got a really good proposal, you want to show it. And if you don't show it in the campaign, maybe you show it in the transition. And we're not there yet. Um, one final word on, on Mexico-US relations. Uh, you mentioned the possibility of, uh, and in particular, you emphasize city to city. Uh, I, I would think that, yes, there is a lot of wealth of relationships between subnational entities and private sector entities and social entities. Mexico and the US are integrated on so many levels. The interaction is so rich and so broad that that will sustain it despite what we do or do not do on messing up NAFTA or fixing it or moving on forward. As, as long as we don't mess it up too badly mm -hmm. at the national level, the incentives are there to continue and, and to profit from it from both sides. Uh, but there is a serious weakness to that because if there's one area where the Mexican state, uh, in a broad sense, has not developed and is weak, is at the city level. Cities in Mexico do not exist, to put it bluntly. They do not collect taxes, and therefore they do not perform the basic duties of government. We have a federal government that is pretty weak by most measures, state governments that are somewhat weak and extremely inefficient and corrupt. Cities, for lack of a better word, are non-existent. So there could be a lot of interaction on a state to city, federal to city, federal to state in the US, but at the city level, which is probably the, the level of government that has a biggest impact on Mexico. And then I would add, maybe that's probably the biggest challenge in policy making for Mexico going forward. We achieved a democratic transition 20 years ago. Um, that started happening at the state level, imperfectly so, as the recent cases of corruption show. But we really haven't given any powers of taxation, which they do have constitutionally, but in fact, they do not exercise to the cities. And that's probably where the weakness of government happens the most clearly in Mexico, and it has to do with the impact it has on violence and security and urban planning on the issues that are most close to people. And I would argue that's one of the elements that are Mexico-specific in this global wave of discontent that has swept away the Mexican political parties. I, I don't want to argue with Jennifer on any, everything you said about the, the opposition parties because I think it's pretty much irrelevant. I think the, the conclusion is they've been swept away. What comes next is more interesting, uh, and, and I think that is very interesting. The fact that they have been completely swept away as, as you concluded. Very good, thank you. You know, we've seen over the past few years, uh, even before President Trump arrived on the scene, uh, we saw it in Arizona where political leaders engage in an ugly debate and we used Mexico as the, as the whipping boy in Arizona with uh, State Bill or Senate Bill 1070 and then the trailer bill, House Bill 1061 in 2010, 2011. And then with Mr. Trump coming into office, um, but so the political ties get crazy. But we see the cities running off. You know, Mexico uh, City has offices from Phoenix and Chicago and Tucson and other groups, San Diego, uh, that are interested in creating close ties. The rhetoric coming from the president and the challenges between the relationship are they impacting the 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 trust that the Mexican people have with the United States? Oh, yeah, that was Mexico. not where I thought that question was going. Um, you know, so I had to think about that for a minute. You know, I think that um, globally, and so I could maybe talk about my reflections more 
not just about Mexico, but about other countries more more broadly, given the opportunity to study and, and not study, but speak and 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 consult in a variety of countries in Latin America as well as, as Asia. I think actually something ironic has has happened, which is I think Trump's rhetoric in being so um, transparent, right, in being so bombastic and being so clearly inflammatory um, has actually generated a lot of sympathy for everyday Americans um, working and traveling and, and speaking, as even in the global south. And so I think um, in that sense, there's it's almost he's almost such a caricature that I think uh, people who are not subject to the own fake news machines in their countries, which is a real issue, right? Um, sort of think, well, it can't possibly be the case that that many rank and file Americans um, <clears throat> believe what he says, despite the images that that flood the airways. So I think I can only speak not having researched this from a personal experience, but I have actually found um, to, the need to be less defensive as an American under the Trump era than perhaps under previous administrations that were not as popular abroad. Um, and in that, that sort of more educated middle class folks in these other countries sort of get that there is a representational mismatch between the election of Trump, not with a majority of voters, with a majority of Electoral College, yes. Um, there's also a representational mismatch um, in Congress, right? Um, because of the way the primary and the party system works in the United States, the decisions that many senators often make are not reflective of the majority uh, opinion, right? Um, polls showed that a majority of Americans on average were opposed to um, confirming the recent nominee for the Supreme Court who was confirmed. So I think that in Mexico and in other places I visit in Latin America, you know, educated middle class, upper class folks get that representational mismatch. Um, and I do a lot of work in South America and what I've generated in South America is a lot of um, folks who've said, wow, we've seen this movie, we know how it ends and we're sorry. <laughs> frankly much more pessimistic about that. I think uh, there hasn't been deep damage to Mexican and U.S. relationships because the perception of the U.S. is shaped uh, if you are, as you said, over the past few decades, I would argue, uh, after, over the past few centuries. So it hasn't had a deep impact yet. If the rhetoric changes in two years or in six years, there will probably not be a very deep damage to Mexican and U.S. relationships. But if you continue down that road, there will be very deep damage, and that's the most dangerous thing that could happen to the U.S. and Mexico. If you just look at a map of North America, you can see that we are both blessed to be surrounded by oceans and isthmus to the south, tundra to the north, and that the biggest risk to each other is not getting along, because there's 125 million Mexicans, and there's uh, 300 million Americans, and we could spell trouble for each other if we don't understand each other and are friends to each other. So I do think it's extremely dangerous. It's probably the biggest existential danger for both the U.S. and Mexico above China and North Korea. This is the most dangerous situation going forward, which is a clash between Mexico and the U.S. We're not anywhere near that, but it's not helping. Just to clarify, my opinion was shaped by interacting with everyday people. I think if the question were about government or policy officials, my answer would have been different. So, uh, you know, just a, a few uh, brief comments. Um, I think that the, the bilateral relation is still solid and productive and constructive. But if the new trade agreement is not ratified mm -hmm. and the U.S. withdraws from NAFTA, I think that would be a big political problem, not only an economic problem, because as I said, that was the reset button. Uh, you know, relations were very difficult even in, in the mid 1980s over the killing of the U.S. drug enforcement uh, agent. So, you know, it's taken us uh, both countries a long time to build trust. And when Mexicans were listening to uh, the rhetoric of the new U.S. president, there was no fear. I would say there was more of a surprise like, hey, I thought we were friends. I thought we were partners. So we had a rough past and we sort of reset the relationship. So I think we have to be uh, very careful about that in terms of the, the, the sense uh, mm -hmm. of, of the uh, presidential rhetoric. Uh, I think it varies by region. Uh, 
but I, but I do think this is very uh, very delicate situation because there is also some incipient anti-U.S. feeling in Mexico. As I said, you know, Luis and I were part of the generation that pushed the reset mm -hmm. button, you know, and we just hope that things don't go off uh, the rails. We shouldn't take this mm -hmm. what what we built uh, for granted, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I, mean, if I could compliment that. I think the reason that there's no real damage yet is because there hasn't been any economic damage. No? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, sticks and stones can hurt my bones, but worlds will never do it. I think Mexicans have given the benefit of the doubt to the U.S. Insults coming from a candidate or a president have been uh, left in limbo. If there was mm -hmm. a pullout of NAFTA and real economic mm -hmm. damage, that would change everything yes. radically. I just want to add, too, um, I think another consequence of this rhetoric um, not just for Mexicans and Mexican Americans and Mexican origin folks residing in the US, but one of the consequences is for the US Latino population more broadly because there's an important elision in this rhetoric where Mexicans become the stand-ins for all Latinos, even though all Latinos in the US are not of Mexican origin. And so I think also domestically, the kind of elision between Latinos and Mexicans and what this means for other national origin groups and the perception of prejudice um, to other national origin groups who are being tarred in this way and what that then means for those bilateral relationships with countries in Central America, with countries in the Caribbean, I think is also very very, very consequential. I mean, we're focused on Mexico, but I think the rhetoric is often conflating these two, and that has very serious consequences for the well-being of not just Mexican Americans in the U.S., but other mm -hmm. Latinos. Let's switch to the audience and give you a chance to, to ask your questions. I ask you, please stand and state your name, and um, we'll make sure everybody hears your question. Please, right here. Thank you. I'm Richard Downey, and uh, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Uh, you know, I've been talking with a number of Mexican friends, and it was surprising to me how many of them are very optimistic about AMLO, and, and particularly in the area of anti-corruption. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, also interesting to me that, you know, this, uh, it's for a good reason. I mean, you had, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, the PRI for 70 years ran basically on patronage and corruption, and that was how they, they managed it. Yet the Fox administration, Calderon, Enrique Peña Nieto have not been able to change that, that mode. Uh, and so, and Jeffrey, you mentioned the, uh, some of the perks that, mm. that uh, AMLO is cutting away. Yet, uh, so I mean, that's, that on one hand, that would be, oh, wow, well, that's okay, he's really gonna go after corruption and change this. Uh, but on the other hand, he's not calling out people in his own party or team who, who, are, who have been charged with corruption. So, I wonder, is this just a question of, of more of this, you don't know, he, he says, uh, what, what he says, he says to this to this group, this to that group, or is or is there some optimism he really will do this? I mean, is, is there something from his experience in Mexico City as mayor uh, that might indicate that, yes, he's really committed to this and that, that we're gonna see some major changes? Should we take several questions? What, no, let's answer this question and then we'll get some more. Yeah, I'll be glad to take a stab at that, and good to see you here. We should look neat uh, on the East Coast, North Coast. West Coast. Uh, I'm not optimistic, okay? And I, I'll tell you why. I think he is in earnest, mm -hmm. but you cannot just say that you combat corruption the same way you sweep an apartment building from the top down. You know, that's a good you know wisdom from a fortune cookie. That's not public policy. I'm sorry, right? And... Reducing the salary of, of bureaucracy is not combating corruption. It's sh shooting yourself in the foot. I'm sorry. And um, I think there's a good chance that there could be a blank slate for some previous uh, corruption incidents, you know, sort of a forgive and forget, let's move forward. Um, I'm not completely sure that's the right way uh, to go. But my biggest uh, concern has to do with the fact that I don't see a public policy that's clearly set out. Again, I, I think that the intent is earnest, it's honest. Uh, and <clears throat> without that, I don't think that there will be a, a lot of uh, inroads. And at the end of the day, I think this has to do with rule of law across the board. Rule of law affects corruption, affects violence. I think that's, that's the bottom line. And if you say I'll do some sort of a weird poll to decide mm 
on the airport, you know, that's not transparency and accountability. And then, but I won't consult when I'm gonna build our refinery. I don't know, I'm, I'm just not too optimistic. Sorry. I would argue that's a little worse than that. <laughs> there is only not only not a plan for fighting corruption, at least not that has been made public. Maybe there's a secret plan. Like Trump had a secret plan in the vault that he would not show you till after he got elected. Um, his plan for everything else was, I will fight corruption. What, how are you going to fix the highway system? By being honest and fighting corruption. How are you going to fix the school system? By being honest and fighting corruption. It became a joke in the second debate because he answered every single question by saying, I will be honest and I will fight corruption. So not only is there no good plan for fighting corruption, that doesn't make it impossible. He could come up with a plan. People who have been thinking about it for a long time could give him a plan. He could actually try to implement it and he could actually be mildly or moderately successful. But so far, there appears to be no plan. Not only that, it has permeated the rhetoric into everything else in policy. The answer to most policy questions is, I will be honest and combat corruption. And that will fix everything else. And that's not a plan to govern. So on a policy perspective, I'm extremely pessimistic. This is what I spent the past six months doing, pointing out that there is no plan. <laughs> on the other hand, just the fact that he won has already reduced the discontent that Jennifer so clearly stated. The discontent in and of itself was a big problem for Mexico. So if you take away the uh -huh. discontent, you build on the other strengths of Mexico that we've been building up over the past 30 years. Take the U.S. economy that's doing pretty well, stock market jitters over the past few days notwithstanding, and things could plausibly turn out for the best. There are some dark uh, clouds, particularly regarding security and the rule of law, but things could turn out for the best. And a lot of people want things to turn out for the best. Just the fact that a lot of people want things to turn out for the best is a reason in and of itself to be optimistic. But if you look at the policy proposals, it's very hard to have a reasonable debate that we have a good policy platform going forward. And Mexico has had a pretty good policy platform for quite a long time. So we're gonna have to learn to live with a lesser policy platform. Is that the only determinant, the most important determinant of how the country will do? Probably not. But if you look objectively at the policy platforms, they're weak at best. Jennifer, would you like to respond? No, I'll, I'll in the interest of more questions. Okay, <laughs> next, you, sir, in the back. In the decades that the free led the country, Mexico's constitution was very often amended. And that, that was possible because the free dominated the national legislature and also enough of the state so that the amendment process could readily happen. Uh, the last few administrations, that double dominance, state governors, state uh, uh, legislatures, governorships, and the national legislature to readily amend the Constitution hasn't been in place. Where does that stand uh, by virtue of the current elections, and what, what difference does that make going forward? Well, the Enrique Peña Nieto, his administration actually um, passed a hallmark constitutional reform, and they did that without having a congressional majority, right? And so that congressional reform in 2013, 2014, um, addressed what, at least on the political side, um, addressed what were considered to be some of the um, problems that still dog the Mexican political system, right? So they ended no reelection, excuse me, <laughs> long afternoon. They ended the ban on re-election and allowed for re-election, among other changes. So it is possible to amend the Constitution without having um, a majority government, and certainly um, that was one of um, Peña Nieto's signature accomplishments, was being able to clean up those parts of the Mexican Constitution that were seen as being outdated and unhelpful. And of course, he then squandered that goodwill in failing to um, address a variety of other problems. But um, I don't think that the problems at this moment that confront Mexico are constitutional, right? Um, they are public policy problems, and they are deeply embedded in the federal and state governments. But after the last constitutional reform, it's not clear what else is in the way, at least at the constitutional level. Uh, I would go even further. I mean, Peña Nieto reformed most of the policy issues at a constitutional level. Uh, 
it looked at the time that that would give him permanence. So the capacity to reform the Constitution actually now that impairs the whole reform agenda. But I, I would argue that's uh, probably not the most important thing. I, I think the PRI amended the Constitution hundreds of times, literally, and it didn't really matter because you had very little enforcement of those constitutional principles through enacting legislation and through the court system. So you, you reformed the Constitution hundreds of times in the 70s and 80s, and it didn't really matter. It was a statement uh, of principles. Now, we are, at the same time, before we get to what's going on now with AMLO and what he might do with a constitutional majority, since we made those hundreds of reforms, we suddenly have a more independent Supreme Court mm -hmm. who is actually forcing the government to implement some of those principles through enacting legislation. Mm -hmm. So now we have this huge backlog of things that have been enshrined in the Constitution that slowly but surely mm -hmm. are beginning to be enforced and be put into enacting legislation, pushed by the courts. And some of these rosy sounding principles are extremely complicated or impossible financially to implement. So we have this long term process in which we have this beautiful constitution full of beautiful things that we sh are obliged mm. to do for all of our citizens that do not have a practical way to being implemented. But now the courts piecemeal, because that's their job, whenever a case reaches them, they force the enforcement of them. So you have this process in which the constitution is now bearing upon policy making of Mexico in a way that we never have. Now, add to that the fact that AMLO could reform the Constitution almost at will, and it's going to be uh, interesting for constitutional scholars uh, in the next few years. Just a, a, a quick word on, on the Constitution and public policy. You know, completely agree with what uh, Luis and Jennifer said. But it, in addition, you know, Lopez Obrador has a de facto supermajority. So Morena has a simple uh, majority, but de facto in terms of political uh, coalitions. Uh, that exist or that could be easily built, there is already a supermajority and he could easily amend the constitution. But if you're focusing, say, on energy policy and the energy reform, you don't need to amend the constitution to halt the reform. For example, the next government could say, I will not put up new blocks uh, for a bit. I will stop fracking. And fracking stops. You don't need to change the Constitution. So in terms of its effect on policy stability, it, it's limited, at least in, in the areas I'm looking very carefully at. Yes, sir. From U.S. policy towards uh, China, economic policy towards China has taken a very uh, significant turn in the last few months. And I'm wondering, uh, with opportunities actually for Mexico to reclaim uh, position in, in the global supply chain that, that somewhat was lost to China over the last 20 years. I mean, it, and it just strikes me that there may actually be a real upside uh, for U.S.-Mexican economics when you take the situation of China into account. Interesting perspective. That's the plan. No, seriously. Well, it, it, it seemed like that Mexico had been a loser since China joined the WTO. And its behavior was rude dramatically and pulled the global supply chain to China. And Mexico lost the position it had. I, I would argue that China's rise has been the biggest economic phenomenon in the history of humanity. Right. And it hit us head on. That, that's for sure. Now, I bemoaned some of the complicated and baroque rules put into the new NAFTA. They're probably bad for the competitiveness of North America. They're probably bad for the management of the treaty itself. They're probably just in and of themselves being complicated, not a great idea. If you look at the balance of those restrictions and those distortions, there is a plausible argument that it could favor Mexico. That, uh, for example, the core of those rules are in the automotive sector. And if you look at those complicated rules, basically all the US car builders meet those rules already. So the incentive for, would be for the non-US auto companies to have more of their research and development facilities in North America and their plants in Mexico. So I don't know if it's gonna work, 
but I do see that the incentives are, were, they try to put them in place in that direction. They might not be enough, they might not work. I think there's very little risk that it will actually damage the incentive to invest in Mexico, at least for the auto industry. Uh, but there is certainly upside. And I would argue that complicated Baroque as the result the treaty is, it has given something positive to the US. Uh, the US actually now has a, a policy that you might not agree with, you might not think is the best way forward in terms of dealing with China. But if you read NAFTA, it's a much more coherent platform of trying to deal with China's certainly unfair trade practices, which this may not be the best way to address them. But if you look at the treaty, it's trying to bring some of those distortions that arise naturally from regional treaties and try to have those distortions favor the development and integration of regional bloc in North America. So yeah, possibly it could not only not affect Mexico severely, it could actually have a huge positive impact on Mexico. I don't know if it'll work uh, how it's intended. And for the US, I do argue that uh, it has given the US a plan. I don't know if it's the greatest plan. I don't know if it's a great idea to be confronting China in the, the way the US has tried to confront China. I do think there are a lot of issues that China was not playing by the rules of global uh, multilateral uh, agreements, uh, but it has given more coherence to what seemed more uh, an intuition on the part of the US president, more than a strategic plan for dealing with these trade issues on a global scale. Uh, briefly, two two additional thoughts. Uh, agree with uh, Luis, but uh, uh, first of all, I think that Mexico is also well positioned to attract Japanese mm -hmm. and European investment because of the comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which should hopefully enter into force sometime next year. And Japan is a part of that. You, the U.S. is not part of the CPTPP, and Mexico is upgrading its trade agreement with the European Union. So Mexico could also uh, attract investment from Japan and from the European Union. Regarding specifically China, there's an interesting uh, commitment in the new agreement that says that if one of the NAFTA, let's call it new NAFTA parties, uh, negotiate a trade agreement with a non-market economy, read China, okay, uh, they had to inform the other parties. The other parties have the right to sort of uh, examine the agreement and they can sort of withdraw from the agreement and leave the, to call it, the offending party outside of the new agreement. I, I don't think that's a credible threat. I think that's a signal of uh, the U.S. to its other uh, trade partners, but that's there. And then just uh, today, uh, the uh, chief uh, negotiator for the AMLO team uh, announced that Mexico might start trade negotiations with China. So I still, I think they still to need to make up their next government. They need to make up their mind about what their strategic outlook is and how they're going to deal with China. And I am one confused uh, former trade policy maker here. <laughs> Let's get another question. Mine's a little bit from, a, it's actually quite a large shift. So I'm coming to you more from the street. So I'm a criminal defense attorney and I have clients who I have sat with in um, in my office who's who have cried, they've wept at, about the level of corruption and violence that their families are dealing with. Specifically, this one family who I love deeply, that their family they've had um, avocado orchards. They were a very wealthy family, and they had avocado orchards for hundreds of, or a hundred and fifty years. Yeah. And they were forced by the local gangs to rip up these, I mean, it was like to see this, these men and these boys crying in my office about being forced to rip up avocado trees that were 75 years old and that they're being forced to plant narcotics in their fields. And if they didn't, one uncle was shot to death. So you, we're having this really interesting kind of esoteric, for me, a, a very esoteric conversation about things that don't impact the people that I, the Mexicans who I love, who are being directly impacted by, like, so when you're talking about, like, corruption, and it's the cops that are the ones, actually, that come in and kill in, in these towns. It's the police officers. And so I'm trying to, as I'm listening to you, what my brain says, my American brain says, oh, if we have all of this trade in Mexico, then 
there will be more prosperity for Mexicans, and just like in, you know, whether you're talking about the, the Middle East or in the poorer parts of this country, that men, mostly men, will not be drawn to this lifestyle of violence because they are so hopeless. So I'm wondering what, as you guys are talking about law and order, the cultural shift that seems, at, and the level of corruption, what has to happen and it, are you thinking like we start in the cities? I guess it seems so esoteric to me. What you're talking about when I'm dealing with people on the street who are suffering tremendously. Let, let me be extremely pessimistic about that. We can. Uh, there is no strategy on Lamo's part. So don't be optimistic about that. He could come up with one. He might try to do whatever he thinks is best. As long as the U.S. has a prohibitionist policy regarding drugs, there will be a huge economic rent to capturing that market. Mm -hmm. Mexico is poor, institutionally weaker, and less populated in the north of the country. Therefore, the staging ground for introducing drugs into the United States is naturally Mexico. So as long as there's prohibition in the United States, there will be people who will try to take control of regions of middle to north Mexico. Since the economic rent will be huge, they will have huge resources to take control of those territories. And the form of taking over those territories will be at least partially violent. So the violence will not end as long as there is prohibition in the United States. It's the 1920s, except the violence is in Mexico. It's funded and it's armed from the United States. And that's not going to change. We can do a lot of smart things in Mexico. We could legalize marijuana in Mexico. That's better for a health perspective. Well, it's already and, changed, right? yeah, well but we, we could do a lot of things, and we could do improve our rule of law, which is not great, and we could train our police better. <laughs> and there's a hundred policy things that we haven't done that we could do better. But in the end, it's not going to solve the problem because the problem is a joint problem between the U.S. and Mexico. Right, and it's whack a mole, right? Because marijuana is legalized here, so now marijuana is not the issue, and suddenly I'm dealing with fentanyl. It, from as long as Mexico, there is a, a, the illegal drugs that are popular in the U.S., you have illegal drugs that are not popular, it's not a problem. Very popular illegal drugs, there is a black market that generates an economic rent. As long as there is an economic rent, that economic rent capture will take the form of capturing territory in Mexico, and it will be financed by that rent. I think that's a basic economic reality. I speak to a lot of people who want to talk about regulation of drugs in Mexico, and I think they're right. I don't think by, if you do it in Mexico, it's gonna solve the violence problem. It's a joint problem between Mexico and the US. We're getting the short end of the stick. We get most of the violence. Mm -hmm. You get deaths from fentanyl, we get deaths from a shot in the back of the head, which is arguably worse because the second one, you cannot prevent it. It just happens to you uh, from a third person. So we can do a lot of things. It could improve, it could get better. But the central issue is a joint problem, and it has to do with the illegal drugs and the weapons trade. We are right at 3.30, but I get the signal that we can have one more question. So let's have, I know there was a couple of hands over here. Please, stand. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Sarah Fields. I used to work in the California State Senate, and I was lucky enough to be part of a group of legislative staffers on the city's uh, state and federal level to go down to the U.S. consulate in um, Tijuana probably about three years ago. and. Uh, it was it's very beautiful and nice, and it was built kind of during this time post 9/11, where they're built into these kind of fortresses outside of town. And really, one of the most disheartening things I've ever seen is that it's a really underutilized consulate. It's huge, and half of it is there to process immigration that it's just not used. It was built under this idea that we were going to have comprehensive immigration reform, and it hasn't happened. Um, it's used periodically for a VA clinic. I encourage all of you to look up information about deported vets. Um, but that's kind of it. And so I wonder if you can speak to kind of what can be done while the U.S. doesn't have comprehensive immigration reform to make Mexico, I don't know, a, a better place for opportunity um, for its own citizens. You know, uh, thank you for, for the comment. And I think that a lot of the action has to be uh, local. Um, as I mentioned, two of my three ch uh, children were born in San Diego, so I know that area. 
very well. And in addition to the U.S. consulate, there's a wonderful pedestrian bridge, right? So you land in Tijuana and you cross a pedestrian bridge and you, you cross the border legally, efficiently. And I think that's an example of how things should go uh, forward. And I think that, that a lot of local actors should, you know, be more sort of uh, engaging, atrevidos, daring to speak out, to travel to Mexico. Some of the best and most novel Mexican cuisine is from Tijuana and from Baja California. We've got the cholos, you know, soccer. Uh, so, so I think it, a lot of grassroots uh, work could help. And uh, lastly, just to be sort of able to speak to your to your neighbors, to your friends, just don't wait for someone else to do it. Let me just give you a quick anecdote. So my wife and I spent about six years there and and we were you know doing our grad studies there. And she once t uh, told me, you won't believe what just happened to me. A colleague of mine, you know, they were you know, pursuing doctoral studies, asked me why there were so many Canadian cars in San Diego. And my wife said, what do you mean there are so many Canadian cars? Oh, come on, you, you're not looking carefully. All these license plates say BC, they're coming from British Columbia. And I said, look, how about Baja California, you know, half an hour south, don't look at Canada. So it's as if a lot of people that even live close to the border did not even realize there's something called Mexico, Tijuana, you know, it's only Canada. So I think all of us can, you know, bring more awareness. I mean, even if it's a trivial thing, just, just do it, just do it. <laughs> I mean, I always struggle because I, when I give talks, I want to underscore the seriousness of, of the violence, right, which has been lifted up in a variety of, of macro and, and micro ways. But I wrestle with that because I don't want to contribute to the perspective, perception that you should not go to Mexico, right? I was in Mexico City last week. And so I think that um, telling the kinds of stories that facilitate the, the kinds of micro interchanges that create knowledge and cultural capital and, and opportunity. And so finding a way to address um, the violence and speak about it in real terms, because I think your intervention, you know, reminds us these are real, real people that are being harmed. Um, but not let that create myths about the kind of place that, that we are. But I think on the side of the violence, the violence as, as my colleague said, right? I mean, the violence affects economic opportunity. It structures economic opportunity. It creates the limits of what is, is possible to do or not do. And so if you are in a, a, a state that's not as affected by violence and you are middle upper class, there's enormous um, economic opportunity for you in Mexico. Um, but if you are uh, poor, whether you're in cities or rural areas, or you're in a state more affected by violence, you are going to be caught up in these kinds of, of webs of, of extortion and limited choice. And, you know, I don't have rose colored lenses about legalizing marijuana. I offered that to the audience to sort of know what might be on the table. Um, I do think I do have empathy to those who have to make criminal justice policy and approach criminal justice reform in, in Mexico because this is a problem that is, is deeply rooted and um, smart policy solutions have been tried under pawn and pre governments and so um, and, and the problem seems to persist and I think the diagnosis really is about what, what's the profit motive. And as long as that profit motive is there, these kinds of obstructions to economic opportunity for local people, um, to the willingness to have interchange are going to remain. No, I was just gonna say, like Luis mentioned something I think is super important for this side of the border to acknowledge, which is the economic incentive is really happening here because all the arms weapons are being mm -hmm. provided from the US to Mexico. But it's difficult for us living in the U.S. to want to really place a plane and identify who's making that profit and, and attack that. It's easy to say, hey, Mexicans, get organized. Come on, what are you doing? But what about us? We need to pressure politicians right here. I don't think we're outspoken enough. I mean, Democrats aren't outspoken. Like Mexican government has also been quite shy at, at placing the blame because they're always like accommodating and trying to be nice. <laughs> I don't have an overarching conclusion, but I, I do want to say a few things. Mexico has not been expelling on the net immigrants for a while now. Mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of opportunities in Mexico. Violence is obviously bad. Um, 
on the weapons, I, I said it's a joint problem. I mean, we're pretty bad at stopping the weapons coming in from the U.S. to Mexico. We're at fault too. You know, so it, it's a joint problem, in 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 a very deep sense. Um, but I, I think um, I, I want to come back to something that, that Jennifer said. Uh, I, I don't want you, the, insecurity and violence and the drug problem is probably the biggest structural policy joint problem that we have going forward. And to put it into perspective, because Jennifer gives a lot of data on the veils, and it's true, and violence has been on the uptick for a while. Uh, but to put some hard numbers onto it, the murder rate in Mexico is in the high 20s now. For when I was born, it was around there. No? And it was steadily down into the 90s. It spiked up to near this levels in the 90s. It went, again, it went steadily down, and now it's spiked back up in 2008. It went down during the previous administration, the first half, and then spiked up back again. So. First of all, if you look at my lifetime, it's actually improved. If you look at our peers in Latin America, you look at Brazil, for example, you don't think of Brazil, like, it is a very violent country, but it's always been more violent than Mexico. No. Central America is by far a lot more violent than Mexico. And to put it finally into perspective, Mexico and the cities in Mexico that are affected by the drug trade are violent in a similar fashion and numerically to the same degree that many of the cities of the United States in the 80s and up until the very early 90s were. You didn't abandon Washington, D.C. or Chicago or Baltimore or Oakland just because the murder rate was in the 30s. So I think the same thing applies. Yes, the violence is real. It's a problem. It's a joint problem in its origins and maybe in solutions. But it's not something so overwhelming and ugly that you need to turn around and look the other way. It's something that needs to be dealt with by both countries because it is a joint problem. I want to thank our panelists for a very dynamic and uh, thought-provoking conversation. Uh, it's been a pleasure to hear the thoughts and perspectives of Luis Madrazo, Antonio Ortiz Menda, and Jennifer Piscopo. I want to thank the three of you for uh, joining us today. I also want to thank all of our participants, and we also want to thank the Pacific Council for making this uh, conversation possible. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day. And our friends at Comexi, Washington. <laughs>